Welcome back to Joy in Our Town. We're going to continue our conversation with Thomas Gagliano. He is a life mentor, speaker, author of The Problem Was Me. In this segment, we are talking about substance abuse and recovering addicts. What is addictive behavior? Addictive behavior is when somebody develops a compulsive behavior towards something. That something could be uh, alcohol, gambling, it could be drugs, spending, it could be sex, it could be anything. And the problem with an addictive behavior is the person thinks they're in control and they're not. The addictive behavior is in control of them. And it creates a distortion. The person believes that it's filling an inner void or it's a way to change an uncomfortable feeling or medicate an uncomfortable feeling. And it's really distortion. It has no long lasting effect. Most people that are addicts are individuals that really never learned how to share their feelings in a healthy way or too afraid to share their feelings. And what happens from there is eventually they're gonna act out those feelings in destructive ways. They're gonna act them out with bullying, with addiction, with domestic violence, or they may act it out with isolation, depression, or I'm sorry, act it in with depression, isolation, or they may do both, but they keep isolated. They're not individuals that talk to other people. How does a person become an addict? Well, first of all, you can become an addict from a coping mechanism you learned from your parents. If your parents were addicts, they showed you that this is how you handle life. When things are tough, you go do this. But I believe all addiction, bullying, and all the other things I mentioned earlier come from a negative core belief. That's what I see addicts have. Addicts have all negative core beliefs. And what I mean by that, I, I, for me, is as a child, my parents weren't around. So I developed a belief in me that I wasn't good enough, that I wasn't lovable, that I was defective. And that creates an isolating person. See, I'm not talking about my feelings. And eventually, I'm going to come up with this destructive entitlement. And what I call destructive entitlement is when somebody gives themselves permission to act in ways regardless of the harm it causes themselves or others, and that's addiction. And all addicts have a destructive entitlement where they just lose sense of how much they're hurting themselves or others. That addiction becomes like oxygen. Do you think people use their addictions to maybe have the courage to talk about their feelings, to say like, if they only talk about it when they're under the influence, maybe, or if they're making them feel, if they're making themselves feel better, so they think. So they think liquid and courage, I guess sure, you would say. Sure, true, and it could it could do that, but the problem with addiction is it always wants more. It's progressive, mm -hmm. and it gets to the point where the person's life becomes unmanageable. It starts affecting many areas of their life. Can you walk us through the process of addiction? Yeah, addiction, addiction comes from, as I said earlier, a negative core belief. It's when somebody acts out feelings rather than talks about their feelings. And it comes from a, an individual that just is not comfortable in their own skin. And they start to pick up ways to make them feel better, as I said earlier. And that builds and builds and builds until eventually they have consequences. Those consequences could be that they lost their job. It could be they have problems with the law. It could be that they're having problems with their family. Usually when those consequences begin, that's usually when they begin to have the willingness to ask for help. And that's really what they need to do. They need to begin to ask for help and allow other people in. But here's the important piece with addicts. Addicts are fragmented, which means their outsides and insides don't match. To the world, they show this, but inside, they have self-hate, they're beating themselves up inside, and they won't, any, they won't let anybody see this. You know, we see actors and actresses that sabotage their careers with addiction. We see millionaires do the same thing. We see people that are homeless. So every addict wears a different mask. But here's where the common thread is. They all have that feeling of defectiveness inside. They're all fragmented, and they won't let anybody see this part of them. Negative self-core belief. That's what it's about. It all starts there. Mm -hmm. Now, why is addiction so powerful? 
it connects on an emotional attachment, a survival mechanism. Like I cannot live without my addiction. It's mm -hmm. oxygen. It's very powerful in, in the, the withdrawals in mentally and physically are very, very powerful. And what happens to addicts is they could stop, but they don't stay stopped. That's the dilemma. They sabotage their lives and they say, I'm never gonna do it again. And that never is a couple of days or a week, but they can't stay stopped. That's the real problem. So what are some signs of addiction? Addiction comes from when you put that ahead of the other priorities in your life. Mm -hmm. And when you can't stop, and again, you're sabotaging employment, family, and all of these things, and you're not able to stop. And it's making your life so unmanageable that it's hurting yourself and hurting those. And when you get to the point that you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, that's an old expression, mm -hmm. that's usually when you allow help in. But you need to take uncomfortable actions. What, I'm, what I mean by that is you have to bring your insides out. Remember I said fragmentation? Mm -hmm. And what addicts have to do is become congruent, bring their insides out so other people can see those insides, like-minded people, support groups, 12-step fellowships, coaches, therapists, priests, rabbis. But somebody's got to know what's going on in here. If that never comes to fruition, they're never really going to get better. They may switch symptoms, they may go from drinking to drugs, or they may go from eating to gambling, and they may think, oh, see, I can handle this. But they're switching symptoms. They're not taking care of what the real problem is. Explain to the audience what you mean by fragmented. You've used that term, and just in case they don't understand, explain what that would mean for addiction. Fragmentation comes when you're not congruent when you have this inner world going on here mm -hmm. of how you feel about yourself, but you show the world this piece. It's the outsides, it's the masks, it's the successful business people, it's the successful actors or actresses, it's the successful or even the people that aren't responsible addicts, that have no life, that have no homes. The inside is how you're feeling about yourself. Mm -hmm. And that I don't want people to see. So when uh, an addict starts to bring this out and talk about those negative core beliefs, talk about becoming accountable to those like-minded people, that support group, that 12-step fellowship. Now, all of a sudden, you know, there's an expression, we're only as sick as our deepest secrets. Well, when they start to talk about this, then they're on the road to recovery. And when they stay sober long enough to really understand that this is not oxygen, I could live without this addiction that's when things really start to happen. How and when does recovery usually occur? Well, when a person structures their life mm -hmm. with healthy habits, healthy habits, and this is what I mean by that, the solution to life changes. All of a sudden now, when I have a fight with my wife or husband or boss or children, my solution is not the addiction. My solution is my recovery program. That's where I go when I'm not feeling good inside. I'll give you a personal story what happened to me. Early on in recovery, I get a call from my mother one night, and she says to me, your father is very ill, he's in the hospital, his cancer spread all over, and he really doesn't have long to live. I think you should see him. I didn't have a good relationship with my dad, obviously. I go to see him one night in the hospital, and I'm sitting near him, and as I get up to leave, he says to me, Tom, he says, I was sitting where you were sitting 20 years ago, and I never could share feelings with my father. My father was dying of lung cancer. I could never tell him I love him, and I could never tell him I cared for him. I don't want that to happen to you. As I got up from the hospital chair, he pulled me close, and he started to cry. Now, I never saw my father cry before, never. In fact, if I cried, he called me his little girl. So that's the messages I had. But that day, he was being very sincere. And with all the pain he was in, he saw the pain I was in. Well, when I left the hospital room, I was welled up with pain. And I had to make a choice. I had to either go back to my addiction or go to my support group. And I'll be honest with you, at that moment, I didn't know which I was going to choose. Yeah. And I remember saying to myself, you know, God help me, because I'm not in a good place right now. Well, long story short, the elevator door opens and out pops a guy who happened to be visiting somebody else in the hospital and he was in one of my 12-step fellowships. So I go over to this guy and I give him a big hug and, and that's, I believe, how God showed up in my life yeah. that day. But that's 
what healthy habits will give you. When you're structured around your recovery program, when these things happen, these devastating transitional uh, pieces of life, you're gonna have a choice as an addict on where I'm going. Am I going back to my addiction or am I going to my support group? And if you're structured in good habits, you're gonna make the right choice. Why do so many people relapse? Because they stop doing what worked. They become complacent. It's very easy to become complacent. When things start to get better, you're away from your addiction. I don't need those like-minded people anymore. I don't have to call my sponsor, therapist, coach. I can handle it. You know, when you're with people that don't know that you are an addict, they may tell you, have that little glass of wine. It's not a big deal. Have a little weed, not gonna hurt. A little bet won't hurt you. But if you're talking to like-minded people, they're gonna tell you, you have that glass of wine, you may end up in jail tonight, or worse. A cemetery is filled with addicts that thought they can handle their addiction again, filled. And it's a sad thing to say, but that's what it is. I, when I see somebody have a relapse, days before the relapse, you'll see where they started to eliminate those like-minded people. It just doesn't happen like that. They began the process of eliminating their support group. And when you do that, you're moving back towards your addiction. If, well, let's, it's a two-part of question. What are the keys to sobriety? And if you could offer one suggestion to those suffering with, with addiction, what would it be? The keys to sobriety is staying accountable to your mm -hmm. support group, knowing that I'm gonna have to do uncomfortable actions, like staying away from fragmentation and talking about my feelings with those people, mm -hmm. staying away from isolation, also knowing that this recovery is a process that I can't control. I have to learn this big word called trust again. I lost that early on and now I have to trust again. So if you begin to do that, you can develop healthy habits. So the one thing I would tell people out there is to take a leap of faith. Really do something that you may not feel like doing, and that is trusting those like-minded people, those healers in your life. Allow them in to do for you what you can't do for yourself. And if you could offer one tip for somebody maybe that's watching, that's suffering from addiction today, what would you say to them? Is to stay out of isolation. Isolation could be a very comfortable but toxic place to be. Get out of isolation, you're not gonna feel like getting out of there. But get, call one person, one person in your life that you're safe with, that is not gonna judge you, not gonna put you down, but that you can call, that, can allow, that you'll allow into your life, into that fragmentation that we've been talking about. And maybe they can guide you to get help. And by surrounding yourself with healthy people. You have to. It's very easy to go to the people that are gonna justify your actions. It's one glass of wine, what's the big deal? One bet, how can it hurt you? Mm -hmm. You go where you need to go to get what you want to be told if you wanna go back to your addiction. Well, I would love to have you back on the show. Thank, thank you. you so much. And thank you for being our guest and thank you for watching Joy in Our Town. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network and is made possible by your telethon dollars. Your continual support can keep Joy in Our Town coming to your home every week. Write to Joy in Our Town, Post Office Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711.